we have someone very special here that I want to introduce you to. It was, some of you know Rob and Ann Garten. Uh, now, they're from our congregation, and two and a half years ago, they ended up going to Ghana, Africa. They sold everything they had, and they relocated permanently to Ghana, Africa. That's where they are now. They're a part of the community. That's where their life is. They're going to spend the rest of their days there in Ghana. And they're helping a really very special work uh, with a special couple that have started a work there. And some of you might have heard of Pastor Kwame, but this morning I want to introduce you, introduce you to the man who started the work there in Ghana. Would you welcome with me Pastor Kwame Frimpong? So, step over here, Pastor. I want, I want them to see you over here, yeah. Look at these. Get close, yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a story because you are from Ghana. Yes. But then you came here and then you went back. Tell us how that worked and why is it that you went back? Okay. Amen. Um, I was born and raised in Ghana and came to America as anyone else. Uh, get myself educated and get a good job. I worked for about 20 years, acquired two houses. Everything was good. American dream. Like I can say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one day a friend came to me and talked to me about Jesus. And I thought it was a good thing. So I followed him to a church and I listened to the message and I gave my life to Christ Jesus. In fact, I was so convicted and realized that the past 20 years I've lived here that I'd not serve God or give my life to Christ. I think I've cheated Christ a lot. So I asked him if he could use me in any capacity, I would dedicate my life and also serve him. So God put it on my heart to move to Lancaster here and plant a church. I came to Lancaster, got in a place to start a church, and all of a sudden, a message came for me to relocate back to Africa, where I came from. In fact, I haven't lived here for, there for 20 years, and also I have two little daughters. One is 10, one is eight, uh, 12. So how is this relocation going to be possible? But I looked at it and I see Jesus, through him all things were made, gave up his position, came back and then live with us, go through all the pains which created a way for me to also be salvated. So I have to sell all my houses and everything I have and went back to Ghana. In fact, it wasn't an easy thing, but I trusted and believed God. In fact, before I left, I had seen Rob and Anne. We met in, at Debbie's house, and we became friends. But uh, it was just about four months that I was living. So I left. Rob introduced me to Pastor Sean. Uh, Pastor Sean invited me, and I thought he was one of the pillars or the backbones that supported me to take that journey. Because my journey of going to Africa wasn't popular at all. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the schooling, everything is just like a mess. But uh, as somebody like me going back. So I, I, I left, like I said, and we started crusade when I was in Ghana. Uh, we went to different places, villages, preaching the gospel. At some point, he preached the gospel and uh, 100 people gave themselves to Christ. There was a problem that we did not plan very well. So what do we do with the convicts? Uh, that means I have to set up a place in my house. And then we started a church right there. And sometimes it was so sad when it's raining, they have to go back to my living room. And there was a need for us to come up a place where we can also serve uh, the Lord or worship. We acquired a place and then we started. You see, God is such that in Africa, according to them, it takes 30 years to build a church like this. 
but our church will build be between nine and uh, 12 months. Woo. Uh, today we have... Uh, we have a... We I have think a, you have some pictures of we have a, a little video of yes, the church. Yes. Check this out. This is the church and, and the people that we have, all our all church members. And uh, people are excited. There's Anne. And uh, uh, the good thing is most of these church members were alcoholics. And they have actually given themselves to Christ. Before then, uh, we also saw that there was a need because they ought, we need to take care of the orphans there too because they were in a shabby looking environment. So God laid it on my heart to start something like uh, uh, orphanage. Rob came in, saw that, and Rob said, no, Kwame, I'm going to volunteer my life and also help with this. So today we have finished the um, first phase of our uh, orphanage building, and it is very soon. Uh, so we are doing interior work right now. We've done the, uh, the plumbing and the electric cars. Most of the work are done. This is the old version. And so far, that is what we have, uh, God has used us to achieve in Africa. There's a, it's a beautiful thing, you know, our congregation knows about this orphanage because we've been praying. Yes. And we've been raising funds from time to time. Yes. But it's not our orphanage. It's not ours. It started with, with you and your wife. Actually, you had kids in your home even. Yes. Uh, and so there's a couple of churches and a couple of individuals that have God's heart is just to help what you're doing. Yes. And so we're partnering with you Amen. to change the world on the other side of the world, Amen. to change the lives of children and to help the kingdom grow. Amen. Uh, so you're, you have this church, you're starting the orphanage, and what's next for you? What do you think God is saying is next? So uh, now the next thing is we want to embark on crusades because... Um, let us remember what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15. Go all over the world to preach the gospel. Whoever hears and baptizes will be saved. Whoever does not is not going to be saved. And we live with people that are very good. But we're losing them every single day. It's not a healthy thing or it's not good. So right now we want to acquire machines like uh, sound systems and set up music in a very fashionable manner so that we can go and we'll be attracted onto them and then we push the message to them and then we get them to be on board. Amen. And you're going to be building up churches. Yes. Where, where are you ever going? You're, you're Whatever we the go, churches. I have already trained some pastors. That wherever we go and, and we preach the gospel and uh, we have the convent, then we plant a church there and assign one of the pastors to be in charge so that we can follow up with them. It's a, it's a special calling uh, with Pastor Kwame and um, I'm, really, I'm really humbled Thank you. Uh, that we, we can be friends. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> and to, to share in what you're doing, um, you're... You're pastoring a congregation right now, but that's not really your calling. You're not a pastor. You're an evangelist yes. and really have an apostolic calling yes. to see churches planted all over the area. That's, um, it's very special, Kwame. And Thank you. As a, just as a pastor here, I want to just tell the congregation, this is, this is something, it's a, it's a thing of greatness. You know, to, to leave what you know and to leave what's comfortable. Because, and then God call you and just be obedient. There was, um, back in the beginning of our nation, George Washington won the Revolutionary War. And the general of the nation of France um, later presented, after some years after he was uh, the president for two terms. 
He presented Washington, his name is Bastille, with a key. It's kind of like a key to the city, but it was, a, it was a key of authority. And he gave it as a gift to George Washington, and he said that George Washington was the greatest man that he'd ever known because he gave up power twice. He could have been king when he won the Revolutionary War. He said no. And he could have continued on as president of the United States because there was no term limits, and he said no. He said he gave up what was his twice. And the Bible says <laughs> that to submit and to serve is the greatest. And Kwame, I want to tell you, we, I'm as a pastor and our congregation, we want to recognize that what you did with you and Grace and your girls was just nothing short of great in the kingdom of God. Thank you. And just beautiful. Thank you. I, I want us as a congregation to encourage Pastor Kwame. He didn't know that we were going to do this today, but um, we are going to receive a love offering at the end of the service. So your regular giving, you know how to do that. You can also give and just designate if it's a check, Hope Chapel, and you can put um, Kwame at the bottom or just put Africa, and we'll know where it's going. Or if you do online giving, you just do a drop-down menu. It says other. You can put Africa or Kwame in there. Everything given today will go for your ministry and for your church. Thank you. And I hope for supplies that will take you to the different villages and continue your ministry. The one thing that about um, Pastor Kwame is he doesn't need it. Um, <laughs> this is beautiful, too. Not only did he leave a good job, but, but he already has now forms of income in Ghana where he doesn't need it, need anything from anybody. He's not receiving anything from the church. In fact, he's giving to the church. He's giving to the orphanage. He's giving to the children. He's a giver. He has business, three different businesses that I know of. <laughs> You're a businessman, and God gave you that, that ability um, because of the calling that goes along with it. So he doesn't He's not at here asking for help, but when you see good soil, the Bible says plant seed. And Kwame, I want to say, as you've been faithful with what you have, you've been faithful with little, God says, I want to make you ruler over much. Yes. And he wants, he's, I trust this man. <laughs> I trust this man. He's been trustworthy, you know, and that's special. Guys, it's very special. I want us as a congregation to pray for him and his wife, Grace, and their girls. Um, I asked Pastor Danny to come and lead us in prayer. Would you stand with me? Before we pray, um, I got the opportunity to walk the streets with Pastor Kwame and Kwame's a modest man, so he probably wouldn't tell you, but he's already had a lot of influence in the villages surrounding the orphanage. And I know that as he walks and continues to do everything God's called him to do out there, that he would have more favor and he would be more attractive. So therefore, we can continue this, this partnership that is uh, on the other side of the world. Yeah. Let us pray. God, thank you, Scott, so much for, for Kwame's heart, God. For his ability, Father, to, to say yes to you. And as I, as I pray for you, for you, Kwame, I'm reminded of Isaiah when God is looking for an individual to send out. And Isaiah volunteers himself and says, I will go. I will go and preach the gospel. And God, as I pray over my brother this, this morning, God, I pray for that same anointing that you gave Isaiah, God, to fall fresh on Kwame, God. That you would allow him, Father, to have favor wherever he goes. That everything that he touches and everywhere that he goes, God, wherever he sets foot, that he will have your favor and your protection, God. 
We put him under your wings, God. We put him under your protection because we understand that the devil is not happy with what Kwame is doing. We understand that the devil is not happy with what he wants to do, Father. And we believe, God Almighty, that your word tells us that we find shelter under the wings of the Almighty. And God, we put Kwame under that shelter, Father. We put Kwame under those wings, God, covering him in the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not only do we put his him there, we put his marriage there, we put his children there, we put his ministry there, we put yeah. his, his disciples there, his church there, his businesses there, because we know that the devil will do whatever he can to try to creep his way in to make him fall, God. And I just pray for your protection. I pray for his favor, God. And I pray that you will continue to take him from glory to glory and from victory to victory. And his orphanage that's being built, God Almighty, that we will be able to impact the lives of children, introduce them to Jesus Christ, God, and change the trajectory of their lives, God, for generations to come, God. And we pray for an explosion of growth over his ministry, God, that you will yeah. send converts, God, to his church, God, and they will be able to listen to the gospel and that when their seed is planted, that it will land on good soil and it will produce a much harvest, God, because of what you're doing in this man's life, God, and what he's doing will be generational, God. Because we believe that you are the God of Ab Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God. And you are our God as well. Thank you for this partnership. It's not about our denominations. It's not about the name of our churches. It's about the name that is above all names, God. And that is the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, God. And in yeah. Jesus' name we pray, and we all say amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I, I love you, my friend. Would you do something with me? Um, Kay, come on up here for a second. Um, they, um, in the back there, they just sent me a little notice that says the Gartens are watching. Rob and Ann are in Ghana right now, and they're watching. They often watch our services online. And um, how cool is that? <laughs> uh, I want us to pray. And, and Kay, would you um, lead us in prayer for Rob and Ann? Lord, I thank you and I praise you for the calling that you placed on their lives. Lord, when they sold everything and they said that they would be willing to go, I, I know that they really had no idea what you were going to do in them, what you were going to do through them. And it hasn't all been easy and it hasn't all been smooth. But Lord, there's been a lot of um, humility. And so you have um, done great things in their lives, and you're continuing to do great things in their lives. Lord, I just thank you for the heart that you placed in them to want to go and build an orphanage and get their, give their lives away, Lord. Bless everything that they put their hands to do. Yeah. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Keep them healthy. Keep them strong. Yes. Keep them encouraged. And anoint their lives, Lord, fresh and anew today, I pray in Jesus' name. We love you. Amen. Love you, Robin Ann. So, again, like today, we're going to sow into Pastor Kwame's ministry. Starting next week, we are going to do, we're going to start raising funds to help these guys get that orphanage to the finish line. Woo! Yeah. So for the next two months, every week, we'll be receiving love offerings to help them get to the finish line. They're close. They're close. There's some a little electrical, a little plumbing, some windows. Let's get it done, right? Come on, let's get them over the finish line. If you have a Bible with you, turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I remember growing up, and I, I, basketball was my, my, my sport. I loved to play sport. I played on the playgrounds growing up, and a lot of pickup games. And in pickup games, you know, you choose your team, and then you wait for some other people. And uh, before the game even started, people would be talking, and we call it talking smack, but they would be talking about their game and how they were going to beat us, and it's just part of the game, you know, <clears throat> and it's normal. 
but you really don't know how they're going to play until the game actually starts. And then when the game starts, we'll see, you know, if they really got it or if they're just a bunch of talk. And if they're just a bunch of talk and they don't have a game, there's a name for that. We call them posers. <laughs> and that's what James is talking about. He's talking about people who had a talk but not a walk. In James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, James says this, If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Really, three things. Three things that's mentioned in these two verses, I think, that are super important. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where you, your Christianity has a way to be seen. And James spells it out. And the first one is watching your words. He says, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself. There's something powerful about the words that we speak. In fact, Proverbs chapter 18 says this, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death. The very, I mean, it's the same kind of life. That same word is used in Genesis chapter 1 when God creates man and all the living beings, and he gave them life. That same word is this word in, in Proverbs. The very life that God gives, we can have that same power with our words, life-giving words. The same words that Moses used at the end of his life, and he talked to the children of Israel, and he said, I want you to make a decision. I'll put a decision before you. You can choose life or death. And he says, choose life. Choose those words that will bring goodness, bring God's plan." What is life? Love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives life. In the New Testament, there's a word for life as well, and it's called zoe. It's a God kind of life. It's a life that goes way beyond the normal human capacity do the words that we speak promote real life? Or do we use words that cause division or anger, even death? Psalm 19, verse 14 says this, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's a connection between the words of our mouth and the condition of our heart. In fact, the scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's what's in the heart that's really important. What's going in? What are we putting in here? What are we filling our hearts with? And whatever we fill our hearts with, that's what comes out as words. Are we filling our, our hearts with the things we're entertained by or the things we watch or the things we listen to. Now, I'm not against country music, so this just, just saying, but if that's all you listen to 24-7, your dog will bite you, your wife will leave you, and your truck will break. <laughs> because that's what you, I mean, that just, it's a message. I'm not, I'm not being facetious, I'm being funny. Be, be, be careful about what goes in your ears and in your heart. Be careful. Number two is helping the weak. Second part of that verse says, or the next verse, pure and undefiled religion, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. I, re I really believe that it's God's heart to help the weak. And here you go, this is real. This is real religion. A kind of religion that helps those who can't help themselves. Orphans and widows. It's God's heart. His heart's there. 
Psalm 68 says this, He's a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Not talking about the antelope belly. (laughs) Sun-scorched land is that life that's dry and barren. It's a life that's barren. It's interesting, the um, orphans and Orphans and widows. I'm, I'm, I'm looking over here at Joe Hernandez, and uh, Joe has a missions organization called How, helping orphans and widows. And it's so close and dear to the heart of God, I mean, really. And it's not just an organization for you and your family. It's something that you've given time to. You spent much of your life traveling and helping and encouraging and taking all kinds of people with you. Orphans and widows. Helping those who cannot speak for themselves. The defenseless. Those who don't have a voice. In Proverbs chapter 31 and verses 8 and 9 it says this, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Church, I really believe that in our day and age, we as the church, we as believers in Jesus, need to be people who speak up for those who cannot, who just don't have a voice. And in our culture right now, it's those who are under the threat of abortion. Those kids don't have a voice. They don't have anyone to protect them. They need us to say something. They need us to defend them. They need us to speak for them and to do something. Abortion is the silencing of our future voices. It's a systematic, calculated murder of our most vulnerable and defenseless people. And we must say something. The weak are are also the poor, the ones without the clout, the ones that don't have a a microphone. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17 says this, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. I just love this passage. Really, if you think about it, whoever gives to the poor, kind to the poor, lends to the Lord, it's like the Lord is asking you for a 20, and you're like, here, Lord, here's the 20. And he goes, I'll pay you back. Now, I just want to say, if God wants to, if he's borrowing from you and he, you're lending to him, he's going to pay you back better than you gave him. Amen. It's in God's heart. It's almost like God says, when you take care of those that are weak, I'm going to take care of you. That's what he says. Real religion is watching our words. Real religion is caring for the weak. And thirdly, real religion is saying no to the world. It's keeping yourself unstained. It's refusing to let the world corrupt you. And we live in a world that is becoming more corrupted every day. It's, it's quite, a, quite a world to grow up in, into. Our kids these days, um, I just turned 60, and uh, I know it's hard to believe, but back in the 1960s, it was a different world. It was more like a leave it to beaver world. It was a little more innocent, a little less evil, and today it's a non-stop stream of filth that our kids have to endure. Our culture is in a slide. It reminds me, you know, when the scripture says that in the end times, things will go from bad to worse. And everyone will do what's right in their own eyes. Then the end will come. You know what that reminds me of is what happened with Noah's day. That was the Bible, um, the Bible kind of heading over that whole section In Noah's day, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what they thought was good. 
And there were no morals. There were no ideas of right and wrong because everyone was rebellious. And that's kind of what we're facing. And so to say no to the world is harder than ever. And yet that is what God calls us. He says, I don't, I'm not calling you out of the world. You have to be in the world, but not a part of it. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is what we deal with. The lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? Galatians gives us a really great list. Watch this. Galatians 5, 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, flesh, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity. Is there an earthquake or is that just our youth? All right, you. Woo! All right, I love it. You know what? What a church would be like without noise. Without kids, it'd be a dead church. I'm so glad our kids are making noise. Galatians chapter 5. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, Division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Sounds like a commentary on our culture. Let me, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's the lust of the flesh. It's what the, our sin nature yearns for. That thing that says that sin is pleasurable for a season, but in the end it brings death. The lust of the eyes, it's materialism. And we have it. We live in a very materialistic society. And the materialistic society says the eye never says enough. I feel like I have to battle this on a regular basis where my eye will just say, I'm satisfied. I don't need any. I don't need. The scripture says if you have shelter and food and clothing, with that you should be content. But we're not. We always want that one more thing or whatever someone else has. And just to be content. You see, contentedness with godliness is great gain. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Look what I can do. Look at me. Look what I've accomplished. Aren't I great? The pride of life. I'm taking credit for all the good things that have happened. Aren't I super? We have a, we have a saying, you know, in our home. Nick Kay and I, sometimes people will say, oh, we want to give you this gift. You really deserve it. And our thing is, yeah, we deserve death and hell. <laughs> but we got grace. <laughs> you know, and we really don't deserve it. We can't take credit. For the good things. Last night I was very privileged to go to a birthday party. Not not the regular kind of birthday party where you play party games and you you OD on the uh, Costco cake. Not that kind of party. I went to a birthday party for Bishop Henry Hearns. His 90th birthday party. And they held it at the Lancaster Performing Arts Center. It was about 800 of his closest friends. they celebrated uh, a very special man. He was a grandson of a slave. He grew up in Mississippi, and he was a sharecropper with his brothers and sisters and mom. He became an Army veteran during the Korean War. Didn't graduate high school, but actually went to college. And at college, got an engineering degree in agricultural and civil engineering. In fact, Henry Hearns was the first black engineer with the USDA, agricultural engineer. 
and someone from Washington was there to present him with a, with a memento recognizing that, that achievement. He spent a career, a whole career at Edwards Air Force Base as a civil engineer. He was a pastor in Little Rock here for 52 years. 52 years, retired a few years ago. 52 years. Makes me think, man, I've been here 34 years. Uh, I can do one more year. <laughs> 52 years. Bishop Hearns built a beautiful church building, an amazing facility there in Little Rock, and there's more than 1,000 people in that congregation now. Henry was the first elected black councilman in the city of Lancaster, and he served two terms as the mayor of our fine city. He sits on numerous boards in our community, probably too numerous to count, as he retired from pastoring. That's what he does. He just serves the community. And recently, I joined a board with Grace Resources, and uh, that was invited to it. And I said, yeah, I have a heart for Grace Resource. I love Grace Resource. So um, I, get, I get to the, my first meeting last week, and who's there? Who's a part of the board? Pastor Henry Hearns. I was so thrilled. I thought, this is going to be fun. He mentors pastors and meets weekly with groups of pastors. Many of us in the Antelope Valley would say he was a father in the faith to this valley. He authored a book, When Odds Are Even Through Grace, talking about his life story. Someone showed up at his birthday party last night from the University of Tennessee, where he attended, and they wanted to commemorate the fact that he Graduated there with an engineering degree, and so they started a scholarship in his name. Each year, they were going to give a scholarship to a young black student or students. They were going to give out $200,000 a year in his name. Pretty big. There was also an engineering scholarship in his name at USC. While he was the mayor of Lancaster, he started what we know as the Lancaster Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. He was a civil rights, is a civil rights champion, and started the Martin Luther King Jr. Dedication Day in Lancaster, where we serve. It's a service day, where we remember Martin Luther King Jr. by serving in our community. He started that. For two and a half hours, right, one person after the next got up and honored Bishop Hearns and thanked him. Politicians, community leaders, universities, church members, pastors, and family. And they read speeches. They recited poems. They sang songs. They presented certificates. It was the best birthday party I've ever been to. He might be the greatest man that I know personally. When I first came to the Antelope Valley in 1989, I went to a minister's meeting. They still have it. It's called the AVCMA, Antelope Valley Christian Ministerial Alliance. I went to there and as a youth pastor. Now, it was my first time. And who's the first person that came up to me and welcomed me, introduced himself to me? Welcomed me to the valley. Bishop Henry Hearns. At the end of the party, they invited him to come up and say some words. And they had set a section of time for him. He didn't have anything to say. He said, I don't know what to say. But thank you to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. Of all the accolades of this great man who could have, could have had that point of pride and said, yeah, I worked hard for it or, yeah, I was just stuck to it and, you know, didn't take any credit for anything that went on in his life. Real religion includes watching our words and helping the weak and saying no to the world. It's said that the book of James is the Proverbs 
of the New Testament. It's the practical application of truth. And we think of James. James is actually the younger brother of Jesus. We think of James as the, the one, maybe he's just, you know, pragmatic about life. But I don't think so. It's not just that. There was a need that had to be addressed in the early church. And not just addressed by James, but by several other New Testament authors. There was something happening in the church, in the cities where the church was growing. False teachers were coming in, and they were teaching another gospel. And their gospel it was known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is simply this. It's focused on knowledge, Gnostic knowledge. And all you had to do was get the secrets and get the, you know, the special information. And it didn't really matter how you lived. It didn't matter if you did anything. In fact, you could live an immoral life because you were in the flesh and this flesh was going away. So there, they had a kind of divided view of a, a life dissected. You had a spiritual life, you had a physical life. And it really didn't matter about the physical life. And that kind of teaching was creeping into the church. And James says, we've got to stop it now. Because true theology, true that Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is an understanding and a relationship with a loving, living God that transforms us from the inside out and then we become like him, and we start living and acting like him. It's not a philosophy. Amen. James tells us, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. If you think you can be a hearer of God's word and not a doer, you're deceived. Faith without works is dead, he says. You can tell me about your faith, but I'll show you my faith. What did Jesus say about it? What, was it important? Was it that important how, what we did as opposed to what we believe? Because I know people who know the scriptures. I know, I know people who know more scripture than me. And that's all they know. And they're focused on their information, and it's just like a computer. You can put information in, and they can spit it out. But their life would not, if their life does not reflect Jesus and how they live and act, that information, the Bible says, is useless. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 25. I'm going to close with this this morning. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, King Jesus, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do, 
or one of the least of these you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I, I want us this morning to take this word, this word from James and these words from Jesus, and I, I want us to open up our heart and allow that word to have access. Let it be planted in our spirit. Like the scripture says, hum, humbly receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Lord, we want you to quicken something to us. We want you to change us. We want you to work in us. We don't want to be hearers of the word and not doers. We want your word to have full effect in our lives. Amen? Let's take a moment. Would you bow your heads with me? So, Lord, we come before you. And we just have to cry out for help. Lord, we need you. We need you to help us to watch our words. <laughs> Lord, we can't control this tongue. We need your spirit. We need your help. I pray that we would be like the psalmist and just say, the, let the words of our, our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable to you. Lord, I pray that every word that comes out of our mouth would give grace to those who hear, that they'd be used for life and not death. Forgive us. Forgive us for using a weapon of words. Lord, we pray that you'd help us care for the weak. Give us your heart for people. Give us your eyes. And how you look at people, Lord, would you help us? Give us that ability to see people like you see them. Past their flaws and what their potential is, who they, who you made them to be, Lord. Help us. Strengthen us, Lord, to say no to this world, the ways of this world. Help us from being trapped in a tangle of sin. And deceived into thinking that that's really fun. Lord, I pray that we would hate sin like you do. We really would hate it. Help us to love you so much, God, that we hate sin. We thank you. Lord, we love you today. We serve a risen Savior, someone who laid down your life for us so that we could have life. Help us to live it fully the way you intended us to live. Not a phony faith, but a real religion, a real faith, a powerful faith. So, Lord, when people look at our eyes, they would see, and look at our lives, they would see you. I pray that we would be the light of the world, that we would be that what people are looking for. We would be the answer to hungry and thirsty souls. And, Lord, I just remind him, people are calling all the time. They are calling all the time, but what is our answer? And are we going to have an answer for the hungry? The people are looking for an answer. Help us be the answer. If that's your prayer this morning, I want you to say amen. amen. God bless you guys.